Today, we are talking about the Incoming Privacy Act 2020. It's been the talk of the town for a while in New Zealand uh, in the privacy scene. Uh, the way we're going to go about it is we're going to start with global context. You'll see that my view of understanding a piece of law is to understand the context in which it's being um, introduced. Why is it being introduced? So first, we're going to look at what's happening globally. Uh, then we'll move on to the history within New Zealand. How did we get to where we are today from a privacy perspective? Um, then we'll get into the nitty gritty and go through the major changes. Um, and finally, looking at what your agencies can do to comply, what steps you need to, you need to put in place. So um, has there ever been a more obvious statement on a slide? I'm not sure. This privacy world is changing rapidly. We're seeing an unprecedented um, rate of change and also the extent of change when you look at how many different countries are changing their laws. There have been a couple of sort of big ticket items internationally in the last five years that have really changed the, the industry. Um, first question for the audience. I'm not going to pick on anyone unless it looks like you're not focusing, but um, can anyone think of any of the big changes in terms of legislation that have affected the privacy world? GDPR, absolutely. Any others? Absolutely, yeah. CCPA and GDPR are the two sort of headline ones. The fact that they have extraterritorial effect, so New Zealand companies are having to consider them, companies all over the world are having to consider them, um, means that you know, they're starting to ramp up and put pressure on other countries to, to change their laws. But why is it? What's, what's changed in society that's meant that we've needed laws like CCPA and GDPR? What are some of the pressures we have on us for the changing privacy legislation? Absolutely, technology. Um, and how that technology is being used, I think, as well. So there are, we've got buzzwords, surveillance, capitalism, Internet of Things, artificial intelligence, but when you sort of drill down to it, it's the fact that the way some of this technology is being used is that you know your toothbrush could tell your insurance agency that you're not paying high enough premiums. Um, your watch can tell your wife you're having an affair. It's really starting to, um, the way this technology is being used is really starting to impact individuals. Um, and in response to that, we're seeing global change and Europe's leading the way. Um, that's always been the case because they've got a, a culture in that respect, um, but we're starting to see countries all over the world. This is an indication of that. Um, the pace of change has never been greater. Don't worry about the details of this. There's no way you could keep a diagram like this up to date for even a week at the moment because of how quickly everything's changing. But we're seeing America, Europe, South America, Asia, there's privacy, privacy laws coming out left, right and center. Um, as I mentioned earlier, GDPR sort of fundamentally changed this because you can't just ignore privacy and think, okay, I'm in New Zealand, so I just have to comply with the Privacy Act. We're getting pressure internationally now because you might be subject to a law in Europe or you might be subject to a law in California, depending on what your agency is doing. Again, stating the obvious, this highly connected digital world, the fact that um, our personal information is flowing through a number of different companies, being stored by a number of different companies, being accessed by a number of different companies. Um, that's the global context we're in. And it's that pressure that you'll see has started to lead to our Privacy Act 2020. Um, settle in, because this is my favorite slide, so it's going to go on for a really long time. Um, we could, I guess the reason I think this is important is that one way you can go about a presentation like this is to just run you through the changes. So go through mandatory breach reporting, tell you what it is and what you need to do to comply. But I think in terms of really understanding a law, you need to understand where it came from. We don't just get laws in a vacuum. They don't just get created for no reason. Understanding the context, what's going on in the society at the time that's led to that law, um, provides you with a better understanding of the law as a whole and gives you a better understanding of why we see the provisions we see within that. So I'll spend a bit of time talking about um, how we got here. We could go right back to where the concept of privacy started, which is at least as early as the 
classical philosophers. Aristotle had this idea that you've got the private realm where you recharge and you recuperate so that you can then participate in the public realm like we are right now. Um, that's for another session probably. What we're interested in is the legal side of privacy, the right to privacy. You can, you can trace that all the way back to what's seen as a seminal piece of work um, in 1890, the Harvard Law Review, an article called The Right to Privacy that kicked it all off. But for our purposes, if we're looking at the New Zealand Privacy Act and where our privacy law started, we'll start in the 1960s and 70s. Um, I was just finishing high school, I think, um, and computers were just starting to spread. So uh, interestingly, this is pre-internet, pre any of the sort of connection that we currently have now. Just the fact that we were moving from manual processing of information to automated processing, it really scared society and people had genuine concerns that their privacy was going to be impacted. Um, and so pressure started to come onto uh, lawmaking bodies to respond to that. And so we had some really general pieces of international legislation. We had the um, UN Declaration on Human Rights, um, but it was couched in very broad terms. You couldn't, as an individual, say to a company, I want you to delete my information and cite the UN Declaration of Human Rights. It wasn't good enough. Um, but people, there was this sort of groundswell of support and people starting to start murmurs that, you know, the way these, this technology is developing is going to have an impact on our personal information and our privacy. Um, we need something to happen. If we skip ahead, um, 1980, there's an international guideline that was provided by the OECD. And it was the intention of the guideline was to facilitate cross-border data flows. So it was to allow information to travel from America to Europe and Europe to New Zealand. But what it did is it provided these eight principles um, of sort of fair, these fair information principles that you will recognize now as the basis for our 12, soon to be 13 privacy principles and the principle based approach that we're seeing sort of around the world. Um, so that was 1980. We've got this international, uh, these international guidelines that set the basis for where we're going with privacy. In New Zealand, we, it's kind of a common theme you're going to see. We had a few false starts. We had a preservation of privacy bill that uh, was in the early 1980s that died. We were looking at um, kind of side by side. We were looking at sort of access to information or freedom of information, um, as it's referred to over in the UK, at the same time as we're looking at privacy. So I know we've got a lot of public sector um, representatives here today. The Official Information Act is 1982. So that was our first response, was to draft a piece of legislation that allowed people access to what's going on behind the door in government in certain situations. Um, but from a privacy perspective, we, we weren't there with a piece of specific legislation. The pressure was still building though, people were still concerned about this. It was a hot topic. In the late 1980s, um, we had our first draft of what we now know as the Privacy Act 1993. Again, a couple of false starts, change of government, um, and eventually we get there. 1993, New Zealand releases its Privacy Act. It is, I can't overstate, it was a revolutionary piece of legislation in the world. Outside of Europe, it's the first piece of privacy legislation that applied to the private sector. Um, at the time, there was a sort of trend towards ensuring your privacy was protected when the state was collecting information from you, because there's a slightly different relationship there when the government collects information to when private sector does. Um, but the Privacy Act 1993 had these 12 principles that applied to private sector organisations and life was good in New Zealand. We had the Office of the Privacy Commissioner set up. Bruce Slane was the first Privacy Commissioner. Uh, all of the privacy principles you know now were around. If people were collecting information, they needed a purpose to do so. You could request access to your personal information. Life's good. Um, at this point, I'm just gonna make a quick aside because there's a, if any of you know of the Australian equivalent, 
that's five years older than ours. So they've got an Australian Privacy Act 1988. And you might be thinking, Jan, you're harping on about Privacy Act 1993. Australia did it before us, didn't they? Um, unfortunately, like most things Australian, um, it's overrated and <laughs> largely disappointing. Um, the, when it was released in 1988, for one, it only applied to public sector organisations. It wasn't until the next millennium that they then extended it to private sector organisations in uh, 2001. So there was a time in Australia where contemporaneously you had Google existing, collecting personal information, using it, and their privacy protective legislation didn't apply because it only applied to government agencies. Um, <coughs> disgraceful, really. Um, the other thing about the Privacy Act in Australia is that they've got a big carve out that we don't have in New Zealand for what are called small businesses. So any company that has revenue of less than $3 million per annum, for all intents and purposes, is exempt from their Privacy Act. So if you've, if you've got information being collected by a company that's got revenue of $2.5 million, um, you can't then make a claim under their Privacy Act. So they, they have big carve outs. Um, it wasn't extended to private sector until relatively recently, um, as I said, disappointing and overrated. Um, but that was us. So 1993, life's good. Um, we see continued change. The internet changes our relationship with our personal information. It's very easy for our personal information to be sort of scattergunned everywhere, um, both here and overseas. Again, pressure starts to build. Um, in 2011, there was a law commission report that was released because our Minister of Justice realised we need to do a review of our privacy law in New Zealand on the whole, not just the Act, but all of our privacy law. Um, the fourth stage of that report and that investigation was to look at the Privacy Act 1993 and what needs to be changed. Um, the report recognised that we are not keeping up with the rate of change in terms of technological development. We're really sort of having to stretch the Privacy Act now, and it, it has some um, shortcomings. So they released, it's something like 107 recommendations um, on amendments to just the Privacy Act. Um, again, as I said before, it's going to be a common theme. We had a couple of false starts. So there was an initial bill drafted, um, didn't get legs. In 2014, the Minister of Justice said, we're going to have a privacy act enacted by the end of this year. <laughs> Didn't happen. In the interim, between then and now, we had GDPR enacted, which put real pressure on New Zealand to make sure our Privacy Act was up near that gold standard that Europe set with GDPR. We're going to get into it in a minute. Why? Because New Zealand needs to maintain an adequacy with Europe in order for our data to move freely. Um, but this pressure kept building, kept building, and now we've got to the stage where after some tinkering, um, we've got to a point where our updated act, to an extent, uh, reflects some of these changes that have been proposed. So that's how we got here. That's sort of the context. But what is it that's changed? So this is where we get into the, into the nitty gritty of um, what are the differences. This is the big one. So this is the, I mean, from a um, most talked about perspective, at least, and the sort of up in lights is mandatory breach reporting. Under the current act, we don't have this. So we don't have an obligation that you need to report privacy breaches in any circumstances. But what we have, and this is in accordance with GDPR and reflecting the fact that um, there's been a change whereby there's an expectation that if you have a privacy breach, it gets reported. So you know about it. And also the privacy commissioner, um, who's you know, our advocate and regulator, knows about it. Um, we introduced mandatory breach reporting. A lot of debate around the detail of how this pr provision should be drafted. So initially it was for um, a privacy breach causing harm. And I think the Privacy Commissioner realized if, if that's the standard, we are just going to get a tsunami of, um, of breaches reported to us. So it subsequently got amended to being uh, a privacy breach that causes serious harm. To what constitutes serious harm, there are a number of things to consider. So the nature of the harm, um, 
whether the personal information that's subject to the privacy breach is sensitive, um, the steps that have been taken by the organization to mitigate the breach, um, and there's obviously, as any good drafter does, they've added a catch-all saying any other relevant information relating to the breach um, keeps lawyers uh, hired. So that is what a notifiable privacy breach is. Who is the person that needs to report the breach? We're going to get into this relationship that organizations have whereby you might be the person that's collected the information that is... Uh, holding the information and you're getting it processed on your behalf. So you might ask an agency to, let's say, store the information for you. In that instance, you are still the person that's responsible for breach reporting. So if they have a breach and they're acting on your instruction and only um, handling the information in accordance with your instructions, for the purposes of the Privacy Act, that's still your information and you're still responsible for breach reporting. So we're going to, I think the next slide, we're going to clarify that relationship. Um, but you're the one who has to notify timeframes um, with GDPR they took the approach that they're going to mandate a specific time frame so you've got 72 hours doesn't matter if it happens on Christmas Eve doesn't matter if it happens on a public holiday you have 72 hours from when you become aware of the breach to then notify we have not opted for a set time and instead say as soon as practicable um, which again gives an agency, I mean, it, it puts the heat on that you really get your ducks in a row, start finding out about the breach, finding out how to mitigate it, putting those steps in place towards reporting the breach potentially, identifying whether it is notifiable or not as soon as possible. Um, there are some limited exceptions whereby you might not notify uh, as soon as practicable. One of them is, for example, where let's say it's been a breach because you've had a security breach and you haven't yet been able to remedy it, if you were then to notify the Privacy Commissioner and individuals involved, so it becomes publicly known that you've had a security breach and it's not yet remedied, you just become a honeypot kind of target for a hacker trying to get the rest of that information. Let's say 25% of the information has been breached, you might then make the other 75% vulnerable. But that's a pretty limited exception the general rule is very much that you'll need to as soon as practicable you're going to need to um, notify the commissioner it's not an excuse for example that it might be bad for your reputation as a company if you notify this breach or your share price might decrease that's not going to cut it so that's mandatory breach reporting um, as i alluded to on the last slide this relationship between processes and, and cloud service providers and the agency who is in charge of the personal information has been clarified in the Act. Um, this is consistent for anyone who's familiar with GDPR. This is very consistent with the controller processor relationship. So under GDPR, the person who makes the decisions about the data, what's collected, how it's collected, how it's used, how it's stored, um, they retain responsibility even when they ask someone else to do something with the data. If you're acting on their instructions, so if you're storing it, if you're analyzing it in accordance with their instructions under GDPR, you remain responsible. New Zealand's taken that same approach here, whereby provided they are acting in accordance with your instructions, uh, you will not, uh, uh, for the purposes of the act, you are still holding that information and all of those obligations are still on you. Um, as soon as they step out of the bounds of your instructions, so you've got, for example, uh, let's say a storage provider again, and they start analyzing the data and you haven't asked them to do that. As soon as that happens, they become subject to the act as well. Um, and we'll get into some of the implications of that, especially if they're offshore shortly. Ah, right now, in, in fact. Um, so this is the new information privacy principle. We moved from 12 to 13 to make space for this guy. Um, and that if you are disclosing information to someone overseas, so not this relationship we're talking about before where someone's processing on your behalf, because in that situation, it's still considered to be your information. So it's not seen as being stored overseas, but where you're disclosing, so you are sending information to someone overseas, uh, you need to have certain 
uh, one of maybe four elements needs to be satisfied in order for you to do that legally under the Act. So either um, the individual needs to have authorised it, so you need authorization from every individual in the data set that they recognize that it's going to a country where there aren't uh, similar safeguards as there are in New Zealand. So it isn't equivalent law to the New Zealand Privacy Act, which is the biggest admin you can imagine in terms of getting through this provision. Um, the other one is to send it to a country that's one of the prescribed countries that we're going to have coming in, in regulation. So Office of the Privacy Commissioner is creating a list of countries that are going to be deemed to have similar legislation, uh, comparable safeguards to the Privacy Act. So that will act as a, as a whitelist, whereby if you're sending the information there, you don't need that authorization from the individual. Um, we're waiting on regulations from Office of the Privacy Commissioner. At Two Black Labs here, we're going to be keeping people updated. We're going to have a newsletter and blogs. Um, so if you sign up to those, you'll be kept up to date with all of these changes as they come through. The other prescribed way that you can uh, send data overseas will be if they're part of a prescribed binding scheme. So you might have heard of um, Privacy Shield which is this agreement between Europe and US, whereby if you um, satisfy these requirements and are subject to Privacy Shield, information can be shared because you have certain compliance obligations you need to satisfy. Um, and if you don't, there's a way of you being penalized. So we're expecting, again, regulations from Office of the Privacy Commissioner to let us know what those prescribed binding schemes will be. Um, so that's the third way you can share information. The fourth way is if you believe on, all of this is belief on reasonable grounds for anyone who's interested in the legal technicality of it, but um, if you believe on reasonable grounds that they have similar or comparable um, privacy safeguards to what we have in New Zealand, um, it's gonna be interesting to see how people interpret that when we get regulations that say these 30 countries are all deemed to be comparable from Office of the Privacy Commissioner. If you then want to rely on the comparable safeguards, it'll be interesting to see how people interpret that. But um, that's an agency by agency decision. Um, and that's it, yeah. So you've got those ways of things being uh, sort of deemed to have been comparable data protection laws. And if you want to transfer it somewhere that's not deemed to be compar comparable, um, you will need to get authorization from the individuals. And you'll need to notify them as well of the fact that it's not comparable. There'll be a number of different things, again, waiting on regulations, unfortunately, but they will prescribe what needs to be in that notice to individuals. This is a sad dog. Um, compliance notice and criminal offenses. So I'm gonna ask you at the end of this section whether you think your agencies would be more concerned about criminal offences or the compliance notices that are changing under the Privacy Act. These are the two sticks that the Office of the Privacy Commissioner has uh, with respect to compliance with the Privacy Act. So we'll start with criminal offences. We have a list of offences currently under the Privacy Act um, and the penalty is $2,000 uh, if you breach any of them. We're adding two. The first one is um, on individuals where if you uh, pretend to be someone else in order to try to access their information. So if I were to pretend to be Henry and go to an organization and say, I'm Henry, I'm submitting a, an access request under the Privacy Act, can I have all of my information? Uh, that now becomes an offense. And some of you will have seen there was a quite a high profile GDPR um, report that came out whereby a security uh, consultant wanted to show how weak this data subject access request process can be. So he pretended to be his fiance and scattergunned looking for information from companies in the UK. And he ended up, it was horrific how much information he got just because they weren't verifying the person's identity. Um, and they were just thinking, oh no, we've got this time frame. GDPR has given us this time frame. We need to get this information back to them. And so they were just sending it off. And so that New Zealand's trying to halt that kind of bad behavior by um, adding it as a criminal offense. The second one, and this is on agencies, is that if 
someone were to request information and you then knowingly destroy that information after the request has been made, um, that's also going to be a criminal offence. They have upgraded the fine from $2,000. There have been multiple submissions from the Privacy Commissioner wanting fines under the Act to be up to a million dollars for uh, companies and up to $100,000 for individuals. Uh, they kind of said, oh, we'll meet in the middle and call it $10,000. Um, <laughs> don't do the math, but um, that's where we've landed with criminal offences. So that's one stick. The other is these compliance notices. So this is brand new. Under the current Act, Privacy Commissioner can only investigate someone for breaches of the Privacy Act if it can be shown that there's been harm suffered. Um, that goes now with these compliance notices, and the Privacy Commissioner has the mandate to investigate any agency for compliance with our privacy laws in New Zealand, um, which I think is it's a really good step because there are some privacy breaches. Oh, not I can't say that word. Privacy incidents that um, need to be investigated and people do need to find out about, but that might not have satisfied that test of, of causing harm. Um, what will happen, it's very unlikely this is going to be him just knocking on your door um, saying, we're just doing a checkup. It's probably going to be on the back of some complaints to the Privacy Commissioner um, or a high profile breach that doesn't appear to have been dealt with effectively, but he can commence an investigation. Um, he will then publish a report that has what the provisions he thinks have been breached are. He can tell you what steps need to be taken in order for your agency to comply and also add some conditions to that notice. There's also a sort of default to open whereby he is going to publish them. So your agency will be out there in the media for not having complied with the Privacy Act um, unless that presumption can be uh, misplaced by some certain, if it's, I think there's sort of a balancing act whereby if the, the harm to the organisation outweighs the sort of public interest in them knowing there's been a breach, um, that presumption can be displaced, but otherwise it's going to be a default to open whereby there's a public. So with that in mind, and this is for anything too, this isn't just for not reporting notifiable breaches. This is any non-compliance with the Privacy Act. So with that in mind, who thinks their agency would be more concerned with criminal offences? Who thinks compliance notices? Okay, that's about 100% uh, compliance notices. Compliance notices come from the Act, they are asked six weeks or so. So, if they are asked six weeks or That's right, just to repeat that for the Yeah, to repeat that for the people watching online, um, they can effectively amount to cease and desist orders. So he can; those conditions can be that you stop collecting information until this has been remedied, for example. Uh, this is kind of a minor clarification. Um, just as a quick question, is anyone here a privacy officer for their agency? A few? Um, of the other people who knows who their privacy officer is in their agency? A few, quite a few. That's good. Um, <laughs> that would be brave. <laughs> um, so there is just a clarification here that uh, it re I mean, it clarifies the fact that every agency does need a privacy officer. It also adds on a provision stating that the privacy officer can be external to your company. So you, the same way we have um, people who provide the data protection officer role in the UK is very common now. People are doing it for a living, being data protection officer for a range of different companies. You could have a privacy officer that isn't necessarily embedded within your organisation. They'll have to understand what's going on so they can analyse privacy risk and ensure um, appropriate controls are in place. But it can be external. Can't be a dog. Needs to be a human for now. Um, so information sharing changes within the Privacy Act. Actually, when, when the 2011 report I was talking about was released, the first changes that were made before the big bill came 
in 2012, there was an amendment bill that added in what we now know as ACES, Approved Information Sharing Agreements, which is a new instrument for sharing information if you're a public sector agency. You can share with the private sector, but it needs to be in the provision of a public service. Um, and so we saw this trend towards moving away from the old information matching agreements and wanting to nudge uh, public sector agencies to use other instruments like MOUs and ACES. One of the benefits of ACES is that they go through a public consult um, stage whereby us as individuals within New Zealand get to see how the government is proposing to share the information and can make a submission on it. Um, what the bill has done has nudged information matching agreements that much further into obscurity by saying from the date, the prescribed date that they have, whenever this goes live, there will be no longer any new information matching agreements. You won't be able to enter into a new information matching agreement. Instead, you'll have to rely on MOUs and, um, and ACEs. So eventually, they're going to be grandfathered and, and completely gone. Some other points to note. The first one is um, the application of the Privacy Act. And I think this is a really good indication of a change in direct response to what we're seeing with big tech companies around the world. Um, so the Privacy Act clarifies that it applies to any New Zealand agency. So that is a company that's set up under New Zealand law or has its central management in New Zealand. And it doesn't matter whether you're um, collecting information or, or taking part in activities overseas. If you're a New Zealand agency, you have to comply. The more important piece, I think, in terms of clarification or extension of the Act is that if you are an overseas agency but you're carrying on business in New Zealand, the Act also applies. So you can't use the excuse that, hey, our headquarters are in Panama or we're subject to Irish law if we're in the UK, we don't need to comply with the New Zealand Act. If you're carrying on business, and this is going to be a really important term in terms of how we see it uh, interpreted subsequently, you will fall within the scope. So the only, it's, it's, a, it's an incredibly broad definition. It basically says you will not be exempt from being considered to be carried on, carrying on business in New Zealand, even if you don't make any money in New Zealand, you don't have profit in New Zealand, you don't have a place of business in New Zealand. So those excuses are completely off the table already. Um, we don't, other than that, have much guidance on what's going to be considered carrying on business in New Zealand, but this is going to make people think twice um, when they are operating here, collecting New Zealanders' information and using it. That's really important, I think. The second one is this news media exemption. This is an interesting kind of quirk of our Privacy Act, I think, is that um, Radio New Zealand and TBNZ were initially, um, oh, sorry, Generally, there's an exemption for news media because it's seen as a really important public function that we can have investigations going on and they can go um, unobstructed by people doing access requests, correction requests. Um, but there's a there was a, uh, an exception for Radio NZ and TVNZ. So they were both subject to the Act and couldn't use the news media exemption. The basis for that was that they're a crown entity um, and have sort of a higher standard than, uh, in terms of uh, transparency than the rest of the media. What that meant was from, a, um, from an investigatory perspective, they saw that they were sort of being penalised because they could have people doing access requests and correction requests while they were mid-investigation, and it would sometimes jeopardise investigations. So there's been a change whereby... Um, Radio NZ and TVNZ will uh, also be able to use that exemption. It's probably not relevant to many people, but I think it's interesting. Um, cute kids are there because if you collect information from children, there's a information privacy principle about the manner of collection, how you collect people, uh, collect people, collect information from people. Um, that has, there's been a clarification that recognises that children and young people are vulnerable um, when it comes to collecting information and that that vulnerability needs to be taken into account when you're collecting personal information from children. 
Um, so if your agencies are collecting information from children or young people, that needs to be considered when you're, when you're collecting it. So things like putting it in really plain language, what information you're collecting, why you're collecting it, your old school legal text privacy policy just won't cut it for collecting information from children. This is a real trend we're seeing worldwide as well. A lot of countries are considering um, this point. I alluded to this earlier, the New Zealand EU adequacy. Uh, at the moment, we have what's called adequacy with Europe, whereby they have this standard called adequacy, where if your country's privacy laws are deemed to be adequate with what Europe's doing, um, there's a very easy flow of data between your country and Europe. If not, you need to rely upon some kind of agreement. You need to jump through a number of different hoops. The easiest thing for a country to do is to retain their adequacy status with Europe. Um, ours comes up for uh, renewal this year. And so Europe's going to be looking at us, and they have been looking at us as this bill's been going through, saying, we've got GDPR now. The rights we've given our... European Union residents um, are greater than what we have in the New Zealand Privacy, the Incoming Privacy Act. They have things like um, the right to be forgotten, for example, um, the right to explanation for automated decisions. So uh, when you've got artificial intelligence that's making a decision that impacts you as an individual, especially when it's detrimental, um, you can request from that agency that they explain that decision to you. We don't have anything like that at the moment. Um, and so it's going to be a really interesting time for New Zealand when this comes up for um, renewal later this year, especially if it hasn't passed yet, because we have had you know, this draft of it came out in March 2018. The old story of false starts with New Zealand privacy law continues. We've had two years now. The current, I think TAB thinks best bet is August, mm -hmm. that this is coming into effect, but we're in an election year. We don't know that that's going to happen, but I think you know European eyes are on New Zealand privacy law right now, and if we don't achieve adequacy, it will have an impact on New Zealand companies that need data going to and from Europe. Um, so that's that. In a nutshell, that is the global context, the history, to the Privacy Act, and then some of the key amendments. Um, from an agency perspective, how can you prepare? This is um, such general advice that it's almost useless, but I think one thing that's really useful to discuss here is that as an agency, what the privacy, the new Privacy Act gives you as a, as a piece of your arsenal for getting change in your organization is to say, whether it's to your CE, GM, head of risk, the Privacy Act 2020 gives us an opportunity to completely refresh, refresh our privacy program. For one, we have operational changes that need to be made with mandatory breach reporting, with considering manner of collection from certain individuals. Um, doing the basics well in terms of your collection practices, storing it securely, ensuring that you're only using it for the purpose you've said you're going to be using it for, you have a reason for disclosing it, you're not holding it for too long. Um, I think that the Privacy Act gives organizations a really good excuse to say, we need to refresh all of this. We need to relook at our um, collection practices. We need to relook at how we're securing and deleting information. Um, and I think you can certainly use it as um, one of your bargaining chips with leaders who are making the decisions on how far your privacy program can go or how big the budget is or, or whatever it is. Raising awareness, this is, um, this is another really good way of uh, letting your agency know compliance is required. Um, sending out, well, for example, our piece of our A3 poster on the Privacy Act 2020, if you can put a few of those around your organization to let people know changes are coming. That's why our privacy people are talking about privacy quite a lot at the moment, maybe having quizzes, um, competitions within your agency and then I think those discussions with the key decision makers who decide how privacy um, 
is implemented within your organization, awareness for them is really important. The compliance notices reminding them of the front page risk, which I know for a number of agencies is, um, is one of your sort of key things is you don't want to be on the front page of the paper because the privacy commissioner is saying this agency is breaching the Privacy Act or this agency's practices aren't up to scratch. Um, they should certainly be discussed in those conversations with decision makers. This is a this is just a necessity. We we don't have a mandatory notification requirement at the moment, and so we don't have a mandatory notification process. No agencies in New Zealand will. You need to understand as an agency what does a notifiable privacy breach look like in my organisation. How am I going to consider and decide on whether something is or is likely to cause serious harm? Um, that whole response process, including engaging with your processes. So the last thing you want is a processor of yours going out to all of your customers saying we've had a breach, um, going to the Privacy Commissioner on your behalf. And so that relationship with your third parties that are um, processing your information, handling your information in any way, that needs to be really tightened up. One of the easiest ways to do that is to have a clause within your agreements with each of those processes that you will only act in accordance with our instructions and then in your breach provisions to include something like you are to notify us in the first instance and take our instructions in the event of a breach. Um, all of that stuff needs to be considered almost from scratch given that we've got a whole new reporting of privacy breach um, requirement here. Adopting privacy by design is good practice regardless if there's a law change or not. Um, this is the idea that you design your processes, you design your products in such a way that by default, people's privacy is protected. So the other way of thinking about it is getting privacy involved right at the start of a project or a product development rather than at the end. If you're in a situation where the privacy <laughs> team's seen as sort of the final hurdle or tick box before something goes live, um, you really need to work with whoever it is in, in your organization that decides how engagement with the privacy team occurs and make sure that you're there at the front end so that you can um, kneecap bad ideas. Privacy is more than PIAs for people who are watching online. Um, and this, this kind of feeds in transforming privacy from being a compliance exercise to a business opportunity. I think this is important for those conversations you're having with key decision makers, showing that um, we're not just a, a tick box exercise. We're not doing this necessarily just for compliance with the Privacy Act or our applicable privacy laws. But if you implement privacy effectively, there are a number of benefits. Your data quality improves because you've got an information management process that means you've got higher quality data. Um, you mitigate risk not only for the individuals whose personal information you are guarding, you are holding for them, but also for your business. Um, if there's a breach, it doesn't just affect your business, it affects these individuals and good privacy practice really mitigates the, the likelihood of that. Um, and also from a trust and confidence perspective, you can use privacy as a real point of difference and a, and a sales point for your agency, whether you're public sector or private sector. Public sector agencies really need New Zealanders to trust them so that they engage with their services effectively. Um, private sector needs it for, for similar but slightly different reasons. Um, Apple's a great example of a company that's really staking a claim to being a privacy-centric company and they have built a lot of trust with their consumers because they are going above and beyond just compliance and seeing it as an opportunity to differentiate themselves from the other big tech companies around. So we said we weren't going to do a sales pitch and we're not, but we can help in some free ways. Um, first of all, we have a free uh, readiness check. So we've got, uh, if you send us an email at info at twoblacklabs.co.nz, we can send you a check that you then log in online, answer a lot of yes, no questions that are conditional. So if you answer no to a question, it's not going to pop up all these irrelevant questions. Um, and it's going to take you through questions that will help you to assess whether you're ready for the incoming um, incoming privacy act. Just as an aside, are there 
agencies here that have begun their preparations for the Privacy Act? Can I just have a show of hands? Okay, yeah, a few, a few. Probably should be more. Um, but this is a good way, I mean, this is a good tool to show decision makers or, or to show you, if you're, if you're the privacy officer, that um, there might be weaknesses or, or some other things that need to be considered. So at the end of doing this assessment, you'll have a report generated and sent to you saying, here are some things where you're potentially not quite up to scratch. Here's what you can do from a sort of basic recommendation perspective to make uh, those changes. If you want a full readiness assessment, which is a paid service that we offer, we will then sit down with you, talk through your answers to the questions, sit down with you to discuss those changes and give you your context specific advice. This is another way we can help. Feel free to help yourselves to um, this uh, poster showing the Privacy Act 2020. Um, but that's us in terms of my